Yeah, so hopefully hopefully you'll take a few things away, but I'm sure there will be more questions uh, at the end than, than actual answers. But but that's good. That 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 that, that makes um, makes it more interesting and that, that shows that you you you're kind of thinking about the, the subject or the challenge. So it's not necessarily a topic per se, but it's just the challenge that I think we all facing um, and is the challenge that needs to be addressed. OK, so uh, very briefly about myself. Um, um, obviously, I, I used to work at Abitse for three years um, um, and I continue to collaborate with um, a number of your current lecturers, so particularly with John and Ross, uh, you know, looking at uh, SIT and, and interval training. And I might even cross over to the dark side and do some work with Rhiannon. Um, you know, we, we've, we've spoken about some again, actually, the, the some of the stuff, um, you know, came about, uh, you know, Kind of through the discussions about that integration of different um, different sub disciplines within sports sciences and and coaching as well. So um, I'm very keen to obviously to connect with as many of you as possible. I'm currently a Napier um, um, and and I describe myself as generalist. And what I mean by that, I um, I've got a number of different uh, research interests, a number of uh, teaching interests. Um, and uh, I kind of work with a number of different athletes as well. So that's something I'm I'm really proud of. I'm, I'm you know in terms of working and, and having that breadth of of experiences and knowledge. Some some colleagues and some you know um, uh, practitioners and, and scientists uh, kind of go down the more specialist route. That that's that's not me. Um, but but that's okay. And more than happy to again um, kind of share my opinions on that as well. So I'm I'm a I'm a generalist who who's got a lot of interests um, and is just like generally kind of fascinated by by applied sports science. So I'm very much about the application of science and research that is that is being uh, that is being produced. OK, so if any of you obviously want to connect with me, feel free to, to get in touch. And the, the, the more discussions we having at different levels, the, the better. So in terms of kind of kind of specific um, areas that I want to talk about um, throughout this the, th the stock or presentation, um, what you see at the top uh, is th this is just uh, I'm sure it'll be familiar to all of you. Uh, you know, some of you in third year, some of you in fourth year, some of you are doing research methods just now. This is the this is the research process uh, described um, in a kind of um, relatively simple terms. OK, so, you know, the generation of question, um, obviously subject to ethical approval, data collection, data analysis, um, but then we, we cross over to knowledge management and translation. So what the, the purpose of today's talk is to cover the, the right hand side, the, uh, these kind of components of the research the research process. So I want to talk about the, the knowledge gap, knowledge translation um, um, and the kind of dissemination of that of that research. So it's kind of specifically I'm, I'm going to go through the what, the why and, and, and the how as well. OK, so um, the, the what to me is um, it, we need to have a discussion around the knowledge gap um, between sports scientists and coaches. And I just want to kind of emphasize um, one one thing here. I'm, I'm talking about plural, so I'm talking across different sub disciplines. OK, so I'm not not uh, specifically narrowing down to sports physiology or nutrition or, or SNC. I'm talking about sports scientists, so all the sub disciplines, all the areas that you're studying. Um, um, and coaches as well, or practitioners. So as I said, it doesn't have to be coaches. It could be practitioners. So it could be an applied sports scientist working in a professional football club, for example. OK, so I, I just want to look at the the knowledge gap in terms of what, what is happening in that knowledge gap. So very, very much linking to the, the this this area here in the diagram. OK, then obviously it makes sense to identify um, some of the causes and reasons why that knowledge gap may or may not exist. OK, so I'm, I'm going to be looking and kind of taking you through on a bit of a journey through literature um, as well as my kind of personal experience systems as to why that knowledge gap may may exist um, in, in, you know, in, in out there uh, when sports scientists and coaches um, attempt to work together. And, and finally, you go, how can we actually uh, um, address some of those um, uh, barriers, if you can call it, or, or some of the obstacles? So provide some of the solutions to, to help improve and facilitate that translation of knowledge. So, so this is the, these are the kind of brief aims um, and objectives of, 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 of today's talk, okay? Um, 
with that in mind, um, it, it would be uh, kind of wrong of me to, to obviously pose these questions, but um, don't bring any reflective practice. I'm, 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 I'm a big believer in reflective practice in, in terms of uh, improving our skill set and, and um, improving our um, knowledge and um, and facilitating um, you know um, our development. So what I want you, you guys to think about as we go through again, linking back to those three um, primary objectives or, or aims uh, as I've just uh, identified, you know, the, the what, the, the why and the how. Um, I want you to think um, personally, and you can feel free to jot down some ideas and I'm more than happy again to discuss them in a bit more detail right at the end during the Q&A session is that um, in your sport, do you think sports sciences research benefits your, you know, your kind of the practice and, and what is going on? So again, some of you working as coaches, some of you working as um, sports scientists, some of you SNC coaches, that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to actually think of you know whether you believe that it informs um, um, the the current practice um, or not. So, um, and if you can think of specific examples of where it works really well and not so well, that would be that would be fantastic. Okay, so that's that's just the first question for reflections. Okay, um, you know the 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 second question linking to that is is the kind of you know depending whether you provide examples or not and think a bit more kind of deeply. Um, do you think that knowledge tra knowledge transfer is actually effective or ineffective? Again, um, you know, it's, it's probably the best way to think is through specific examples where you thought that worked really well. The knowledge transfer in, in terms of um, the science that is out there and what is being used in a day to day practice by coaches or practitioners is really effective or ineffective. OK, and finally, I think we all in the same boat. OK. And, and again, we, we all need to take responsibility either as researchers, as tutors, you know, as students, as practitioners, that kind of stuff. I think this, this is applicable to all of us. I just want you to think of different ways of what you personally can do to improve that um, knowledge transfer between, between science and practice, okay, in whatever capacity um um you know that that you may be kind of whatever job and capacity that you may have in 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 the sports world or coaching world okay so these are these are the questions for reflections that kind of want you to keep um at the back of your uh, at the back of your minds as we go um through the talk does that sound okay good brilliant um so i want to do a quick poll i don't have like official polling system integrated in there. I'm just going to do uh, um, a quick kind of raise of hands. Obviously, you can do either virtually or, or some of you have cameras on, which is again much appreciated because it helps to kind of connect um, uh, from 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 presenters point of view. So I just want to do a quick show of hands of um, of who believes that coaching is. The art. And the second bit of my poll will be who believes that coaching is the science? So let's go over the art. Who like show your hands? Maybe um, Rhiannon can be the moderator if you want to do like um, a quick poll using emojis. Um, who believes that coaching is the art? Okay, so how, how many is that? Um, Rhiannon, there's about five, some, some still coming in, five, seven, I see, six, seven. That's seven. OK, so obviously the remaining of you um, believe that coaching is the science. Am I right in saying that? Just a quick nod. Yeah, me saying yeah, yeah. John, where, where are you sitting? Yeah, I, I kind of, it's not, it's not one or the other, if you know what I mean. So I kind of, because, because I think it's, you know, you need to be informed by the science, but I think it is an art as well. So, yeah, so it's, to say is it either one or the other, okay. I find it difficult to. Cool. OK, so you 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 basically answered, you being you being a lecturer, uh, you basically answered my uh, my question. So um, I don't think, and I, I really like this diagram, uh, I heavily plagiarized from somewhere, somewhere, and I don't know what the source, so please don't do that in, in your presentations, but this, this sums up uh, the way I approach performance enhancement and kind of coaching as well. So um, like John was saying, I, I don't think um, coaching can be 100% 
um, scientific because that would leave no room for intuition. And a lot of you guys are actually practicing coaches and, and coaching at, at whatever level, you know, that intuition um, and kind of that decision decision making on, on your feet uh, make you know, plays a big role. OK, that said, I don't think um, that intuition has to has to just come from your intuition it has to be kind of based on on, um, you know, some science and it, it should be evidence based as well. So that that demonstrates the importance of kind of academic and scientific um, um, education and, and, and qualifications in coaching as well. Um, it, so so it's, it's certainly a bit of both. OK, so so the way I see it is a bit of both and um, the ways to develop that kind of performance enhancement, how to, to get that sweet spot, which is somewhere it's a crossover, you know, uh, between the science and the art is through obviously developing a good evidence base um, and knowledge. OK, so so what, what's out there, what's in science, what's in research, how up to date, how how valid it is and that kind of stuff, but also making sure we, we practice it and, and work on that the art side of coaching as well. OK, so that that you can be the best scientist in the world, but if you don't get out there and talk to coaches, to athletes and see their day to day realities and complexities, you won't be able to you won't be able to translate that into into practice. OK, so it's really, really important to 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 cover both sides as much as possible. You probably will have preferences. We all have preferences, but always keep in mind that is a combination of both, right? The percentages, it doesn't really matter whether it's 50, 50, 60, 40. That's not, that's not the point. The point is that you need to work on your evidence-based practice, right? So your, your, your education, your research, your scientific skills and, and understanding, but you also need to get out there and start applying it as much as, as possible because that's, that's how you develop art. Okay. So this is what, this is how I would describe it in terms of you know kind of combining the two the art is understanding the science and then applying it effectively right so you need to understand the science in order to become the better artist in in, in coaching right so your in, intuition intuitive decisions and decision making and thought processes they need to be underpinned by science um and 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 you know that that's that's the way I see it. And then again, f feel free to kind of disagree with me and have a, a kind of broader discussion later on. But I think that that sums up um, my approach to my approach to to coaching and performance enhancement. Okay, and that performance enhancement doesn't have to be high level sport. It, it could be it could be anything. You could be working with under nines, but there is a performance enhancement element or learning um, enhancement element uh, uh, within that. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take you on a little bit of um, um, kind of literature journey uh, from around the globe. OK, so I think that's important if you're talking about both sides, it's important to obviously cover our, ourselves um, uh, uh, that as well. So first and foremost, I'm going to start with some positive news. I'm going to then we're going to go into a little bit of the depth is like, oof, like, is it is it as positive as, as it looks? Um, and then um, I promise to uh, end on the positive note as well. OK, so so it'll be a bit of that emotional journey if, if you if you can uh, if, if you can put it that way. So. Um, the first first thing is to um, to kind of make it clear in terms of what's in in the in the literature out there in research. Um, firstly, what I've noticed again, as I said, it's not really a topic per se. It's not a subdiscipline per se. The knowledge transfer and and and, and the kind of bridging the gap between science and practice is not is not a topic, right? So there isn't that much literature. Um, I've noticed there is a more and more um, different practitioners and researchers and, and and academics come you know have come together more recently to actually try to present different conceptual models in terms of how that 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 gap can be bridged. Um, but it isn't too, too much out there. However, there, there is some literature and, and I'm going to demonstrate that. So the first thing we see here from 2006, obviously I'm not going to go into very descriptive um, information about each each paper. I just want to point out to, to some um, key things is I think that everyone agrees like like we like the kind of the, the mini poll that we've just done. Everyone agrees that that integration is really important, right? So research and practitioners and students, everyone agrees um, um, that, um, you know, science, you know, sports sciences should inform coaching practice or, or practice in general, OK? And, and then obviously that stems from the fact that the role of sports scientists is to uh, 
to inform the decision making, um, to, to enhance performance and make sure that, that that practice is the most effective and safe, um, you know, in, in terms of what is used in, in, in applied setting. OK, however, so that's that's what everyone agrees on. However, if you look and start kind of scratching, you know, um, you know, um, behind the surface a little bit more, we know that that uptake and the research integration, generally speaking, is very, very poor. Right now, sports science and or sports environment is not is not unique in that sense. And um, the same the same is uh, is kind of seen and observed in medicine as well. Um, so so that that poor integration of research in different fields, including sports sciences and sports fields, is 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 um, is quite evident when we start looking, um, you know, for, for for more information. So what that suggests to us is that it's clearly the breakdown somewhere along the way. And what I want to do in this talk, I want to identify some of the areas where that breakdown actually occurs and why that occurs. OK, so like I said, I'm going to take you on a bit of a trip now. Um, around the globe. So I just want to make make sure that this is not unique to the UK, Australia, Canada, Europe, whatever. I, I think it's a global phenomenon and a global challenge that everyone needs to be aware of. And, and that's the that's the kind of ultimate purpose of this presentation to make you aware and understand what role you can you can play um, to, to make it a little bit better. OK, so first and foremost, and, and I have done if I remember correctly, if I I, I have uh, put these studies um, in a chronological order, but so it happens that they obviously um, we're done in in different different continents and different countries as well. So the one of the first studies from what I found, okay, is is kind of dated but not too dated if you think about it, right? Uh, Fourteen years ago, um, um, is it was was performed in Australia again. Okay? And again, what we're seeing is that uh, this is just the coach's perception of um, the importance of sports sciences and you know how much it, what what role and how much of the role it actually plays in the in the practice, right? And what we see and a highlight to this is an abstract. I'm happy to share the slides, and you guys can go away and kind of read in a little bit more detail each paper or any paper that kind of. Um, you think would be most relevant to what you do. Um, but what we see again, the message is pretty clear that coaches and sports scientists do agree that, yeah, it should be a, an effective integration, um, you know, certain in elite sport, you know, between between science and, and, and um, coaching practice. OK, so there is no disagreement in that response in that in that respect. But there is a disagreement on how it's done and what areas need to be addressed. OK, so this is this is obviously, again, the kind of a, a unique study obviously performed in Australia. So it may vary between countries, obviously sports and that kind of stuff. But in this one, in, in this particular study, elite coaches perceived the need for more research in the in the area of sports psychology. So they thought that what is happening and what is being produced in sports psychology and we have um, uh, Ross uh, on, on the line as well. He's, he's well established, well known sports psychologist, so it'll be interesting to hear um, his thoughts on that. Uh, but that's one area that was identified as, as a kind of weak area. And it's like, well, I, if, if you do go away and find any anything in sports psychology published, right, by academics, researchers, we don't think that is valid or relevant to, to our day to day coaching practice, OK? Now, so that's like a specific area that they picked on. Um, uh, and then secondly, is, is actually how that knowledge is disseminated um, and, and passed on to coaches and coaching community. OK, and they saying actually the disse dissemination or translation of that scientific knowledge is, is very poor. Right. So that may explain to an extent that their uptake, which is relatively poor, like I said, um, across the board. OK, and, and kind of linking with that, a lot of it is um, to do with um, the, the, the lay language or an academic language and not finding that uh, sweet spot between what, what language should be used um, and when it should be used and how that, that dissemination should actually take place. OK, so that's that's one study. But I just wanted to kind of uh, make a few mental notes, uh, if you can, as you go along in terms of um, what, what we're discussing. So this study said, OK, sports psychology, according to the group of coaches that they looked at um, and the, the survey that they did, and is to do the dissemination. So that in, in simple terms, that means that what we produce as researchers and academics, um, it, it doesn't get out there. And it, even if it does get out there, it's very complex and too complicated for them to actually pay pay a lot of attention. Another study uh, a year later, um, 
kind of moving across the globe and uh, going to Canada. Um, and, and again, this is a, a kind of Canadian Canadian study, obviously Canadian coaches, uh, 205 coaches, you know, pretty big sample and um, working at um, kind of collegiate level, if you like. And again, what we're seeing that that there was a, a strong consensus. So everyone agreed that, yeah, certainly, you know, if, a, if the previous one was elite elite, this one is still, you know, high level, but even at the slightly lower um, performance level, it's still very important to, to make sure that there is that integration between sports sciences and, and coaching. However, again, what we're seeing here is, is a big gap in terms of the, the needs of the coaches and what is being produced by, by the scientists, if you like. Okay, so, and some of that is to do the coach education. So we can, one thing I want to make very clear is that I'm not pointing fingers to sports scientists and saying that, oh, they're not doing the job well. There are areas that can be improved. But th this this also applies to coaches as well, right? So coaches, there are certain things that coaches could do uh, better as well. So for example, in terms of coach education, we know that coaches learn generally from each other. So informal environment and formal education is the most uh, accepted formal learning uh, in, in coaches at, at any level, right? Um, uh, followed by kind of more formal degrees and that kind of stuff. So we know we know that it's out there. So we just need to make sure we kind of tap into into those um, into those um, you know ways of learning. You know we need we need to find the way how to actually get past that. Um, so. You know, it says here, obviously, most likely to consult other coaches, like I was saying, informal informal learning environments are preferred options over formal learning environments by coaches. So again, that raises some, some interesting uh, questions and dilemma, how to address that. Interestingly, sports scientists and the publications were ranked very low by coaches as a likely source of sports science information. Now, that's not too surprising. If you learn informally from chatting to someone on the field, on the court, whatever, right, it's unlikely that you're going to bring up a specific paper that you read and say, oh, by the way, I read this 12 page paper. Um, you should go and read it as well um, as if you have nothing better to do. You don't have sessions to plan, you know, um, you know, work on other things. So it kind of makes sense because they learn informally more than formally, so it's unlikely they'll be using scientific information within that. Um, and again, similar to the previous study, we see like um, some, some other barriers in terms of the dissemination. So in terms of lack of direct access, a lot of it is, is our own doing because a lot of it is behind the paywall. You need have to pay to access the journal articles unless you're obviously a student at a, at a university and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of different things that need to again improved and, and, and changed in order to, 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 to make that knowledge transfer more effective. Now, the final one is probably most relevant uh, uh, to you guys or to us. Um, um, this one is it was done by one of my colleagues at Napier and Christine Ash, who's at Edinburgh, but she was um, she was at Abate as well. So it's a small world out there and they look specifically at a UK coaches perception of sports sciences. OK, so again, what you'll see that there are some commonalities, there are a lot of common themes coming through. So they kind of broken it down in terms of what themes have emerged uh, from, from, from that study. And the themes were practical application and relevance, integration and access, again, so the dissemination element of it, as well as language within that. So what we're seeing at, we're seeing that the, regardless of where we are, which part of the world we, we we kind of based in, you know, we're seeing the same issue, right? So it's a global it's a global phenomenon. It's a global challenge that needs to be improved, in my opinion, right? In terms of how relevant it is, how we disseminate, and obviously within the dissemination is the language that we use, right? Um, so that leads us on to this diagram. Um, that's been put together again relatively uh, relatively recently by um, Joe Eisenman. Um, I, I think he worked with US soccer most recently, last time I checked, you know, the practitioner, the very strong academic background. And again, he basically came up um, with this um, conceptual model in terms of let's identify, let's have a look of, um, of what's going on. And the framework that he used for for this in relation to sports sciences and sports coaching is 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 what is called translational science. Okay, so is is a almost like a subdiscipline, particularly used in health sciences. Um, it, just to look at again a transfer of knowledge from the labs to the field. So the prime example that everyone everyone is currently facing is the the development of a vaccine. 
you know, for, for COVID. So that's the bench science there, right? And the clinical, obviously, it was clinical studies, a safety regulation, actually a really quick way um, or, or quick method to actually start vaccinating masses and masses and masses, millions, if not billions of people. OK, so that went from bench, the basic science, to actual uh, very much uh, application to ensure that that's the translational science for you, right? So if we use that kind of conceptual framework and um, we can do we can do exactly the same with sports sciences, right? So that's why you've got researchers, you've got ap applied scientists, so you've got a molecular physiology and you've got someone who's working at, you know, the Rangers uh, as as a full time sports scientist apply, you know, really working with, with athletes, you know, it, it could be anyone. Um, so what he what he has done, uh, obviously, he's identified by using translational science. He's identified a number of um, translational blocks. What what they what he called them is translational blocks. So it's like obviously these are numbers. So one, two, three, and four. Okay, and the biggest barrier. So bear in mind that this is uh, kind of based on the American model. They've got a, you know a, a number of specialties and a number of different positions. That obviously collegiate level, NCAA, you know that kind of stuff that we don't quite have it. So you got a athletic tra um, trainer, you got a medical doctor, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff. But some, some of these roles do exist in the UK. However, we've got to be weary that may not 100% apply. However, I think is a nice model to use and identify those translational blocks over here as well, right? Because we know that's the same issue. So, so the, again, the issues stem or, or the challenges stem from kind of three three failures, if you like, the, re, the relevance and application failure, right? The second one is translation failure, like we were saying an adoption and finally dissemination, right? So how prepare, so what, what how relevant what we do, how is that gonna translate and how we actually do our job to disseminate that knowledge that we generate. Because if we generate knowledge or we collect data, but that doesn't have any direct impact, that, that's just that's just number crunching, right? And and to me, that's what that's why I've been thinking about this for for, uh, for a long time and I'll provide some potential kind of broader and, and smaller solutions to that. And what you see at the bottom is like obviously knowledge management and knowledge transfer. So if you go back to my second slide or third slide that, that that was there so it's a big big part of the research process but we tend to ignore that or we tend to kind of not do that as well as on 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 the um a, a kind of along the along the way and, and at a different steps of the of the uh, scientific or research process okay so i you know my i i argue that we need to really improve this bit because it underpins everything else so what you see here and, and i'm not going to go over uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So you got that basic to applied science kind of translation block. Then obviously, because they have other, uh, as I said, other roles and professional um, support staff along the way is obviously taking that information from applied scientists and working with others. So sports psychologists, strength conditioning coaches, um, medical doctors, athletic trainers, and, and that kind of stuff. But then again, the biggest barrier is actually like bringing that science to coaches, right? And some of this stems from the coaches, and this is where everyone plays a big role because coaches some coaches i'm not i'm not i'm not um suggesting i'm generalizing here um, um that some coaches have um that all no attitude okay towards that towards um towards everything that they do and ultimately is their um you know head on the line so if everything goes goes wrong horribly wrong they are the the, the first ones to be sacked so they can decide what they what they take and what they leave okay but by doing that, a lot of them or some of them develop that kind of anti-scientific um, attitude, right? So they, they don't believe in science. They believe that science is too slow a process to benefit. They don't see the relevance. They obviously have issues with the information and dissemination, that kind of stuff. But that's where that's where the biggest barrier exists, right? And I think it's not too dissimilar over here in the UK as well. So, if you can answer this in terms of what can be done, you know, to 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 facilitate that um, the knowledge uh, translation, you would be a very very rich person, I think, in terms of like what what you know what what needs to be done to improve um, and make it more effective. And then finally, you got obviously not just um, between you know kind of science 
right? Um, to coaches, but also coaches to athletes. So that's another important uh, point to, to, to be reminded is that how do we actually pass on that knowledge to coaches, okay? Because that presents a translational block itself in terms of communication, the understanding of what coaches are saying, you know, that kind of stuff. So so that's the biggest that's the biggest barrier, right? So like, okay, so, so you may be sitting there as like, okay, I kind of agree with it, may not agree with all the points, but that's absolutely fine. So I think the next step forward is to actually understand of what each of those, you know, each of those specialists, each of those roles, each, you know, actually entail and what they do. So I've come under this, and again, this is this is this is this is very much based on my personal experience. I'm more than happy and more more than open to to ideas from you guys. So these are the things that I believe sports scientists um, are very good at, right? So I've listed them. So in terms of quantifying and monitoring, kind of linking to that, although I listed there, it's, it's in no particular order, right? So just listed them there is innovating very much or, or largely down to the technological advancement. Okay, so we, we very quick to innovate, we can innovate because obviously it's kind of sports sciences moving along uh, alongside the technological advancements, what's out there, GPS units, accelerometers, you know, all the jazzy stuff and um, that is reasonably cheap nowadays, you know, it can be implemented and used in practice uh, quite quickly as well, right? Then we, we obviously kind of what we do or, or part of our roles as a sports scientist is interpretation of that data, right? So we, we are very we are very good at, you know, kind of in terms of or, or, or what part of our role or big role is to quantify, innovate, uh, but then obviously we need to interpret it in form. If I showed you this list of kind of key roles and responsibilities, where do you think we fall short? What, what are the weak, weakness or what areas would you say need improvement? Again, based on your practice, um, as well as you can probably guess, um, based on the, some of the stuff I've covered um, previously, or you know, in, in in the past few slides. So, wh where do you think uh, the areas for improvement lie? In from training and practice. Exactly right. So, uh, you know, what what I think is that. A, interpretation, and B, informing training and practice. So we, we collect this data, but how do we interpret it? And if you obviously, if you can interpret it uh, well um, in a kind of practical sense, we can then expect it to inform, um, you know, training and practice and, and, and coaching decision making and that kind of stuff. So this is what, you know, again, is, is a very broad generalization and kind of broad roles and responsibilities of sports scientists and there's way more right and, and you know I, I don't want to downplay the role that they play uh, and, and what they do but this these are the kind of key areas and those two in, in the middle in particular require fair attention in, in, in my in my opinion okay now in terms of common coach uh, Com common questions that coaches ask, and this is um, this is based on a very recent conversation I sat on with the um, sporting director at one of the professional clubs in in Scotland. Okay, in football, and these are exact questions that they asked the sports scientist um, uh, who was presenting the data. Right, so it was the the person, the sporting director, was very open minded, um, but these are the questions that he asked. A, what data are you showing? So literally, like don't expect, so it's almost like some of them take home messages coming slowly but surely through as well. Don't expect if you're a sports scientist, don't expect everyone to understand what you're showing. So what you're actually showing or presenting, okay? And the second question that followed um, straight after was, are there similar data elsewhere so particularly talking in terms of Scottish uh, context you know obviously football professional football that's very important so uh, other clubs collecting that data is it published is it not, you know obviously if it's unpublished we don't know but is is there anything published out there because context is key right so it's not not just to do with the rivalry what others are doing that kind of stuff but it's also understanding the context so the more data is out there the better to understand the concept and this is in terms of translation one thing is is again is really really interesting that you would think at the professional level and, and there are reasons why clubs wouldn't share right a lot of the data because obviously they they want to do their own stuff da 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 
but there is very little kind of um, collegiate approach to sh sharing the data, no matter how sensitive or not sensitive that data is, right? Which which surprises me a lot. So in terms of like what 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 is happening across the the whole of Scottish context or UK or European whatever is very little data to be shared um, between the clubs because no one has collated it, right? So that kind of, again, links back to some of the issues to do the translational kind of and dissemination. So that's the first thing. So like, uh, again, think back to what we're good at and what the, the coaches on the other side are actually asking. So what data are you showing, what presenting, and is there any more data on that, right? Then the, 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 the other group of questions, and that's why I kind of put those two together, if you like, here is a, is a, a kind of two questions here to use like, so what did you find, right? So what, what did you actually find? And linking that, how does that affect our practice and our decision uh, decision making? Okay, so how is the data you showing, presenting, regardless of the fact whether there's more data out there to kind of make that context more specific to understand the better? What did you find, right? And then in, in, in linking again, direct link to that, how can it affect practice and decision making, right? If you cannot answer these questions in a very concise, coherent manner, the coaches will switch off, right? So coaches, and again, I'm, 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 I'm making them sound like some sort of, you know, group of people can understand that. That's not that they can understand. They're not, in, they're not too interested in actually seeing lots of numbers. They want quick, stories, tell them a story, quick co coherent story, right, in order to get the buy-in, right? So if you can do it in a concise, understandable manner, because remember one of the barriers is the language that is being used, right, it's too complex, we overcomplicate it, they're going to switch off and move on, right? So we need to, like sports scientists and coaches as well, that's not to say coaches need to not don't need to listen more of course they do but we also what messages we sending and how we sending it okay so make make sure that the story that you're presenting is very clear and concise okay so like i promised i'm going to finish on on um on a positive note so again th this is just another study and you'll notice that the researchers are the same as of one of other studies uh, um published from kind of canada um, um and then again I'm, I'm not suggesting that um, everything that is out there, uh, it kind of gets lost and there's no translation of that knowledge. It, it is some good practice certainly happening, but I can still, I still think that that can be improved. So, so these are some of the ideas that obviously they propose in terms of what can be done from both groups of people or both groups of kind of profession professionals and coaches and or coaches and practitioners as well as scientists right so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna read through all of them but as i said i'm more than happy to share the slides but it's something to something to think about and you'll see again the common themes in terms of the, the language that you use how much how understandable that language the manner in which we do it you know that those kind of different things are really important now, again, some positive stuff, very recent systematic review. So as I said, is, is more and more kind of research being done on this challenge in terms of what 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 can what what is happening out there, how much, how effective it is. So this is the systematic review from 2019 and the particularly focused kind of talent identification and that kind of stuff. And they they if you look at the highlights that, that highlights, that's why I highlighted it, is like it is sports sciences research is actually beginning to fulfill the call for interdisciplinary research and what we mean by interdisciplinary research historically sports scientists and researchers work in in isolation so you've got sports psychologists nutritionists sociologists sports physiologists and they do their own little thing without coming together right if they do come together um, occasionally, that's what is called multidisciplinary. So they are kind of in conversation, debating, you know, co-designing and thinking how we can improve it. But even better, right, we can take it a step forward is an interdisciplinary approach. So this is a problem right in front of you and you have all these different specialists come um, to the table and actually share how can we collectively design and do to 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 inform and support our athletes and our coaches right so there is evidence coming out that more of that is happening but certainly nowhere near enough because i again this is just my personal opinion i think that 
we've almost exhausted our potential in um, monodiscipline or multidisciplinary and the only way to drive performance and performance improvements at any level, any sport is by using interdisciplinary approach. So it's kind of pleasing to see that some of that is happening. With regards to specific models, and again, context is key. So I just want to emphasize that and make it very clear. This is this is another very recent study um, by OT et al. 2000, uh, 2020 is where they came up with a model, uh, a framework, um, kind of outlining some of the things that need to be done to, to bring that interdisciplinarity uh, into. Uh, this is obviously very much to do with high performance sport, but I think it could be uh, um, tweaked and adapted and used at any level. And they call it Department of Methodology, strangely enough, right? So, so you go obviously coaching staff, support staff, and they you kind of they added another um, layer of complexity by looking at specialty roles. So you know, you, you you for example, if you take rugby, you'll have a backs coach, forwards coach, and that kind of stuff, or goalkeeping coach in football, and that kind of stuff. So you know, that's just another complex kind of component added to it um, but this can be taken out I suppose and just looking at coaching staff and support but what you'll see in the middle and, and the purpose they've designed this is obviously again just to make sure that there is a functional integration of, of all staff um, for one purpose only and that is to improve the athlete's development right and, and performance by creating a sufficient uh, kind of or, or appropriate environment in which they can learn right so at the center of this is very much aptly centered approach by designing obviously different different actions different um uh, uh, training practices and that kind of stuff so keeping players and their environment in mind and thinking of what each of these kind of specialists can bring to the table in order to work collaboratively communicate effectively and co-design those tasks to drive to drive uh, performance forward okay so that's like that's obviously high performance it may not may not be applicable to um to, to 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 all of you but it's certainly worth thinking about where you at or where you want to be and how would you approach it from from again from contextual point of view but also from practical point of view in terms of how do you bring all these different specialists together for for the sole purpose of improving um sports performance so that collective system, okay, is really important. So finally, this is my final slide. And again, it's, it's, it's kind of a bit of, I suppose, a, a little bit of repetition just to reiterate the point. So, you know, and, and again, you, you can agree with some of them or disagree with all of them. Uh, it's entirely up to you. So first and foremost, I think when you are um, doing research, designing your research, you need to, uh, need, those research questions need to be coach and athlete driven, right? So the I've spoken about coach um, kind of importance of understanding the practical uh, um, relevance and, and, and application of it, but a lot of good research questions can come from athletes as well. Just to give you an example, um, there's something I've, I've, I haven't thought about a lot um, and, and it's a very topical area um, and it's good because it's way, we are way behind in terms of knowledge is the effects of menstrual cycles and kind of menstruation um, on performance, you know, be resistance, um, kind of strength performance, power, endurance performance, whatever, right? And it's, it's little, little by little more research is being done. Um, obviously, female physiology is very complex. Um, and that may explain some of it, why it's so slow to pick up, but a lot of it's to do with inequalities and that kind of stuff. Okay, so that I'm going to leave that to the specialist, you know, on, on the call if, if they want to kind of take it to the next level and, 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 and understand why it's so little being done, you know, to date. But it's more and more coming, coming out, which is, which is promising, right? So I was working a female athlete and, and it's the first time, you know, first thing I need to say is the first time female athletes, I, you know, I, I mainly worked with, with uh, male um, players and male athletes previously. It's the first time she openly discussed the, the topic, which is a bit of a taboo, but that's because she's kind of a lead performer and um, very performance driven. She knows what um, 
what she wants to do and she 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 performs in a sport there they travel around the world so she's an enduro um mountain um, bike racer and they travel around the world basically by themselves as a mechanic uh, you know as part of the team and maybe a team manager so they go to canada tasmania is coming over to scotland in, in in the borders as well you know to do different stages and different races so they're very much on the road they very much kind of take their performance enhancement into their own hands right because they they can't it's simply it's simply impractical to to have a coach if you like and it's not that much money so anyway so 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 a it's the first time i've spoken openly about you know kind of the topic that is so so important and depends a lot of things that we're doing but b one thing that like never ever thought about it you know she said yeah obviously there are effects we know that you know it's, it's no not news any female will tell you that obviously it has different effects throughout um throughout the menstruation depending on on what what phase are you in but what she said, she says that doesn't that that is important. But what's important to me even more is to actually that I need to train at any stage from my menstruation, right? So them saying that like okay, this is this is how it affects that that is important. But I also need to know like how to train regardless of what, where I am at in my in my cycle, right? So that's like that's that's coming from athlete who who has been there, has done it and has experienced it. So it's almost like an integration of science coaching and athlete. And that's why it's important to talk to athletes as much as uh, you, you talk to to coaches as well, because encourages that communication it can uh, bring up a lot of interesting points and questions that doesn't mean that you have to turn them into research automatically but but it also as a as a result um creates a buy-in right so if you openly discuss some taboo subjects you really kind of show interest in them and really take their points on board it can it can help a nice uh, a nice kind of uh, cohesive environment to work in Another point to, to be reminded, as I said, we're possible work in multi and interdisciplinary teams and take um, everyone's perspective. So challenge your biases. We all bias in many ways. So make sure you actually expose yourself to different uh, specialists as much as possible. Um, or at least think of where would that sit in the, in the broader kind of uh, context if, if not possible just now. OK, so so, you, you know, that that is important to kind of um, get different perspectives and different ideas from from many uh, many possible angles. Better dissemination of research finding findings is is required. Again, in order to achieve that and facilitate that, you need to understand the why, right? So you need to fully understand why you're doing what you're doing. Otherwise, you won't be able to disseminate uh, the research uh, and knowledge that you actually generate. Research language should be understandable by coaches like we've seen in um, in a lot of research papers. We obviously seen uh, I've experienced that you probably experienced as well in terms of, you know, if you go to the coaches, lots and lots of data, they'll switch off. You know, that, that is the reality. So don't make any assumptions that, you know, they can understand everything. And that's that's nothing to do with education. They may they may not have time to understand everything. So you need to be careful in terms of what language you use and how much and that kind of stuff. OK. Make research more accessible to increase its adoption. This is where social media, um, you know, blogs and, and websites and videos can be a, a, a good tool, you know, to drive that forward in terms of getting the message out there. And finally, we all need to play the role in integration of that research. OK, so this a lot of this obviously kind of more from sports science point of view. But if you're a coach sitting on the other side of the fence, you need to make sure that you're open minded. Right. A lot of this is to do with coach coach education and obviously that can be improved as well. So we need to bring more science to coaches for them to slowly start learning from it. Um, but we, we all play a big role in terms of promoting that integration of research. So as a coach, don't don't just point fingers to the other group, the other camp. And this is where it's amplified that from what I've seen that they don't know what our, our requirements are and vice versa. OK, so make sure you actually try and promote that effective integration as much as possible in whatever capacity you can. That is that is me.